Hola, buenos días. Okay. Um, yeah, so obviously my presentation title has changed. It's like a talking point. Um, so I originally got here to do a campaign. I'm going to talk about like what bumps I encounter while being here. Um, but my title changed to Los Derechos de Personas en Situación de Discapacidad y Formación de Autogestores. And so that is, um, I was focused on looking at the rights of people with disabilities. In Spanish, they say personas en situación de discapacidad. Um, which I'm going to illustrate why later. Um, and um, I did a self-advocacy based intervention. Um, so project phases. Um, first I had the literature review that I was doing for the first couple of months that I was here trying to get the project off the ground, um, see other sorts of sources of financing for the campaign and kind of like measure the interest in trying to build a sustainable project around that. Um, so that was that phase. Next, I did a development of materials, which is a little bit different. Um, I used a participatory-based methodology. Um, so I had to do a lot of interaction with people with disabilities to formulate my research materials because they were my target population. So um, I had to work with various individuals with psychological and intellectual disabilities to develop my surveys, my focus group questions, and my interview questions. Um, the third part portion of my project was implementation. Um, and then lastly, I'm currently still in the intervention stage. So, um, literature review. So from March until May, I was really concentrated on trying to make the campaign take off the ground. So I don't know if you guys necessarily remember. Um, originally I came and I really wanted to do a campaign with people with disabilities to try to combat stigma. Um, and so I was really focused on that and organizing different groups and trying to meet with different organizations. Um, and sadly, things kind of didn't necessarily pan out very well in that sense. Um, I was doing a literature review um, and I was focusing on, uh, I had some delays because a lot of the results weren't necessarily published on time. So when I got here, the Chile had just conducted a new survey on disability, it was a new national survey, um, and they had started publishing the results in PowerPoint presentations with very few points in February and they're still putting the results out to this day. So. Um, you can access it and go into Stata and try to evaluate it yourself, but it's a lot nicer when you don't have to go through um, 300 questions and figure out what information you want to pull from um, or extract from uh, a census. Um, the last week of March as well, Chile um, had an exam in, um, in Switzerland uh, in front of the Commission on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, which was a huge basis of my study because I was focusing on the international convention from the United Nations. So they actually had their exam this year, and they had to go and present what they've done since ratifying the convention, um, but that wasn't until March, and so I had to transcribe afterwards the interviews. Um, and then also, like, I hit another road bump with my literature review because the commission was supposed to, uh, there was a, an ex accessory committee to the president <coughs> dedicated to disabilities, and they were supposed to publish the report in March, and they didn't publish it until late May. Um, and so it was a two-year analysis of what public policy problems there are in Chile and what steps forward they need to do to um, resolve the situation for persons with disabilities. So that was my literature review. It got delayed. Um, and I'm still starting to analyze and delve into these things just because I was like, my project was extremely time sensitive. Um, but road bumps. So my project was obviously really time sensitive. Um, I hit a, a, I hit a, um, a wall. I don't uh, I got to the point where in my project um, I wasn't seeing that if I did the campaign I had achieved interest in financing in a sense that I had to like apply for it, but I didn't necessarily see it sustaining into the future. Um, someone actually taking an active role in implementing it every year or continuing with it into the future. So I decided because it wasn't going to be sustainable, it wasn't necessarily a good idea. Um, to combat stigma or discrimination, I think it's a repeated process. And I realized that after Christmas break, um, no one was really necessarily going to take the reins and keep going with it. So I set that aside and I decided to work specifically just with people with disabilities and empowering them. So I was doing the diagnostic um, analysis on like, the literature review and what rights were available to people with disabilities and what public policy programs are, or pu public policy problems exist in Chile. And then I decided to focus just on um, training. Um, because when I was doing my implementation of my surveys, I started to realize that people have no idea what's going on. Um, and so to really make sure that they understand their rights before getting that, I, I really wanted to ensure that they understood their rights before getting um, and participating in a campaign against stigma. I think they need to know what stigma is, discrimination is, 
and what their rights are um, and what the convention is. So I decided to focus on that. Development of materials, methodology. So I used a participatory research model. Um, it wasn't necessarily completely participatory because of time constraints. So doing a participatory research process takes a lot of time because it's a lot of feedback um, and it's a lot of give and take. And it's also a lot of conducting the research with people with disabilities. Um, and so it was using their input, um, but not necessarily like they were the researchers. With the intervention, we're doing more of that, but um, with this portion, it was more of just getting their feedback. So it's about conducting research with others. Um, people labeled with learning difficulties have the right to be included in research concerning themselves, which I think is a really important point. Um, often times they're just recipients of information and recipients of services, and that doesn't necessarily help them to empower and be an active participant in the shaping of their future. Um, and it comes out a lot in my research. People don't know what they like. People don't know what they want to do. People don't necessarily, haven't been asked to um, do something necessarily at a higher level before. Um, and yeah, so inclusive methodologies and accessible resources are really important. And so for that portion, it's really key to work with people with disabilities because they're obviously the experts of materials being accessible to them. Um, and yeah, there's just a few quotes, I'll run through them. But um, this is something that I developed. So I took so I had to take my consent form that I made um, for uh, the organizations and anybody um, like that was a worker at an organization that wanted to participate in my research study. This was the version of the consent form for them, and this is the first page of the consent form for like people with disabilities. So this is an easy read format. Um, and there's actually, it's really hard to do the formatting. And it's interesting because what I would do is then I would sit down with someone and I'd be like, okay, just do these images help you to understand this? And it's this is actually a novel concept in Chile, so a lot of people <laughs> like take my research materials and duplicate them. But um, I sat down with multiple people with disabilities to discuss this, discuss the language, um, keywords used if we needed to explain certain concepts. For example, like anonymous, the word anonymous, what does it mean? So we put a person and like it's like a secret. You know, and so that helps people start to internalize the information better. Um, pictures are normally like a sense of reaffirmation. Um, so that's like one thing that I had to do. So this is like accessible format example. Um, so implementation, after I had uh, formulated all of those materials with them, um, in June I finally started to begin to implement the, the informed consent and interviews so I could then go to focus groups. Um, so I got five organizations on board, um, and so I'm working with two versions of Rostros Nuevos, which is an organization for people with psychological disabilities, um, and I'm working with two programs, one in Santiago and one in Valparaiso for people that are homeless. Um, and then I'm working with Goenil, I don't know if you guys have seen Goenil, they're, um, they're at the national level of Chile, um, but I'm working specifically with one of their um, uh, like work formation locations, and then I'm working with Best Buddies in Chile, that's an American organization um, started by the Kennedys, and then Leaders con Mil Capacidades, which is really interesting because they are the example of self-advocacy here in Chile, um, but it's really interesting when you start to ask people like what they know about self-advocacy, like what, how, what formation they've actually gotten. So I used a model more based in the United States, Australia, and Canada, which is much more based on formation, conferences, um, capacitations, and um, trainings, I should say. Sorry, I'm speaking in Spanglish. Um, so, you should, and so it's much more based on actually making sure that people um, understand the information that's being them. So yeah, um, this is like an example of my survey. So my survey was actually, it was pretty long in total because we wanted to get, uh, gather a lot of demographic information, but I ran into road bumps with that as well because, so for example, in Chile, there's a status called interdiction and interdiction literally revokes in Chile all of your legal rights. So you are no longer viewed as a citizen of Chile. Um, you're viewed underneath someone else. It's extremely, extremely invasive, extremely problematic, especially with people with mental disabilities. And also the civil code says that if you are deaf or deaf and mute, you are automatically un, uh, unable um, to act for yourself. Still, so these are like policy formations that need to change. Um, so it was really interesting. So I wanted to know like how many participants were declared um, unable and there are no statistics. So um, even organizations don't even know if they have someone that's in, uh, if one of their participants is declared um, 
unable, which I think is extremely problematic because then you don't necessarily you're not necessarily understand like the legal implications of working with that person. So um, we did de demographic information. I had photos to accompany each of these questions. I had to develop it with people with disabilities, um, and then specifically the portion that I was measuring was if they knew what a right was, if they could give me examples of rights. Moreover, if um, they feel like they can t make their own decisions, give me examples of those decisions that they make. And then in this moment, if they feel that they can choose who to live with, where they want to live, if they want to leave, um, and if they can choose like who to spend their time with. And these, it, it would it turn into a dialogue, which was really interesting to hear like what people would say. Um, and then I worked um, with the basic principles of the convention, which is autonomy, um, auto-determination, dignity, independence, inclusion, accessibility, and respect for difference. Um, and so I'd ask them if they've known these and then to give me examples. And this brought up really inter interesting data that I'm starting to, I'm gonna start to analyze, but for example, like dignity. I worked with a lady with, um, that specifically responded, yes, I know what dignity is. I was deprived and violated of all of my human dignity in one of the centers here, one of the hospitals here, um, that's a psychiatric ward. Um, and so it's interesting to hear their stories and like the, what they associate with these words. Um, and it's really interesting to hear people say like they know these words and they don't know how to define them, um, which I think is really problematic. It's just not taking time to give um, information of quality. Um, and so then the last two questions were if they knew about the convention, if they could give um, examples of rights, and then moreover if they knew that the convention this is super technical, is super constitucional, but it's because in the exam Chile said multiple times to the committee that it's super constitutional, it's super constitutional, we treat it like it's super constitutional, and even legal, um, legal like lawyers and like people that work within lawmaking in Chile recognize that it's not treated as such. Um, and then if they know any, um, if they knew any policies or norms in Chile for people with disabilities. So that's my survey. Um, and I implemented it with over 80 people with disabilities, so this takes like 20 minutes <laughs> or like to an hour with each person depending on like how much they want to talk, but it was a really interesting um, field work portion. So intervention. So basically after, basically after implementing my surveys, doing focus groups with people to talk more in depth about what their experiences were with rights, I decided to formulate um, a self-advocacy based intervention based on that um, and talk to them really about what rights were and try to break down the information for them. So. Of course, I was really ambitious with my intervention, so I planned like multiple phases and methodology, and um, like had many goals. Um, but at the end of the day, I decided to cater it to what they needed. Um, so it changes every week. Um, but I began to realize that the participation of people with disabilities in Chile was symbolic rather than active participation, um, and that people with disabilities lacked the comprehension and the accompaniment necessary to be able to actually engage in the formation of public policies. And Chile actually has a law that states that you need to work with people with disabilities to formulate policies that affect them, but how are they gonna work with you if they don't know what's going on? Um, so I started, I formulated the intervention based on the concept of self-advocacy in, in the United States, Canada, and Australia, which focuses on people fighting for their own desires, um, making their own decisions, having their voice reflected in the decisions that affect them, um, asking for help when it's necessary, which is really key because a lot of people think that if you have independence and you're autonomous, you can't ask for help. Um, so we had to work a lot on that concept and people that defend their rights. And the last one um, was actually developed by a participant and it's doing a type of monitoring. Um, oh, the change, the implement. Yeah, so this is the diploma. Um, I went into it thinking I was going to work with each group for two hours and that caught up to four. So I work with five groups for four hours a week. I start on Wednesdays and I finish on Fridays. Um, and it's really interesting, it's really fun, and then I work with the Universi Universidad Católica to implement the um, diploma, and they're getting all certified in a couple of weeks. Um, and then this is the model I developed. Um, this is autonomy, communication, or no, this is um, self-awareness, communication, autonomy, empowerment, auto-determination, which is like being goal-oriented, um, and then fighting and defending others. So every week we're supposed to develop one of these, um, which didn't necessarily turn out as such, but we're working on it. Um, but just to kind of give you guys a background uh, of what I do to break down the information to them. So the, what a disability is based off of, or how it's measured on a global scale, the World Health Organization has developed a CEEF, which is the classification of functioning, um, that measures, oh no, it jumped. Okay. Yeah, so it measures disability, and it defines it as an interaction between a condition, a, a health condition, ah, oh, it's jumping. 
Yeah. So, um, sorry, this is was, this one was a really interactive one. I think it was really ambitious to shoot it or to send it by um, email. So the CIF basically isn't this. This is what we developed it into. So the CIF measures one, your condition, your health condition. So it looks at like what is your health condition specifically, what does it imply, what are your symptoms, what medicines do you need. But then there's another portion of it which is called functioning. So how does that, or it's called performance. How does that person perform in their environment? So it looks at like what supports they have, it looks at what um, like education, it's more of like a socially based um, uh, evaluation. And it's really interesting because what you end up seeing is um, with the definition that we developed and how I broke it down for them, is we turned it into a condition of health and life. So, um, because it's defined as something that is of large, um, a lo largo plazo, as something of uh, like of larger duration. Um, it's not necessarily a condition that is just for a short amount of time, and the CIF only measures like the condition at that moment. So, the con if we combined the CIF and the CRPD, and we developed this one. Um, to define a disability. So types of difficulties, you have people with physical disabilities, sensorial disabilities, intellectual, and psychological. But we decided that the environment should be based off of attitudes, accessibility, help, and structural barriers. And so what the Steve allowed us to do was transform and show like that there's two portions of the disability. So it's more than just the condition that the person has. Um, and so there's an example that I developed with one of my tables, um, and they wanted to talk about a person that has a health condition. So they have schizophrenia and they have depression. Yeah. So it's this person, health condition, neutral. But when this person interacts with society, they're told that they're sick. Um, they're told that they, um, yeah. So they're told that they're sick. Oh, this is actually what we developed. Sorry, I thought this was a different one. This is actually what we developed to present to the Ministry of Health. Um, so this was a woman that had been interned, um, and so she, when she was in, when she was forcibly interned, um, she was just given pills and injected. So she would go to sleep, and she would wake up, and there'd be syringes, and there'd be people taking her blood against her consent, and she never knew what was going on, and she'd be asleep like the whole entire time. And so she was talking about her experience and the, how those are like attitudes. So it's like treating someone like less than human. Um, accessibility. So, um, for example, this woman, this. Uh, she went to the doctor this month, and the doctor shut the door on her face, and uh, no, the nurse shut the door on her face, and her doctor didn't even show up. So obviously health isn't accessible to that person with a disability. Um, and help, so help while they're attaining services. Um, so the doctors don't have time or patience with them, um, and, they, and they don't have psychologists on site that can help somebody understand like what their condition and what necessarily the treatment while they're interned or even like undergoing treatment on a day-to-day -day basis implies and structural <coughs> policies um, like the one that I mentioned that allows the substitution of um, consent um, and so as you guys can tell this generates a situation of a disability because a person without these things so a person that is treated like a subject of rights a person that has access to um, the health system and a person that has access to the su sufficient supports and has policies in place that support their um, decision making generates a less form, lesser form of a disability. And that's why the model now is to talk about a situation of a disability because, oh, that will go back. But that's why the model now is to talk about a situation of a disability because it's a person with the same exact condition, so you have this person that their health condition didn't change but their supports did. And this person is able to function in the environment at a much higher rate than somebody that has more barriers and encounters more problems. Um, and so this is like how I break down the information with them and what we talk about, and it generates interesting debates. Um, so the groups I'm working, they're the only ones that decided to have a name, um, but these are the people from Guanil. Um, specifically, each group has a project that they're developing to try to like have them be proactive and engage with their rights. So they're doing right now a video um, against bullying, an anti-bullying video, and so they talk about their bullying experiences and what they had they had in school. Um, I'm working with a group of people um, that want to develop a book about how they got to their own situation. Uh, well, here they say situation de calle, how they became homeless, what being homeless implies, which is really heavy because they talk about how they used to fight in the streets for certain things, um, and they recognize the indignities that they have to face. Um, and then I work actually in the Fulbright office, thank you, um, on Thursdays with a group that's doing um, 
uh, discrimination in the workplace. And specifically, they wanted to see if other people felt discriminated against in the workplace and not just focus on people with disabilities. So they're doing a video. And then the other two groups, um, one is doing an evaluation of accessibility. Um, so they're doing it specifically in the, the, um, the Quinta Región. Um, and then the other one is wanting to develop better rights associated with a disability card. So yeah, so I'm in that right now. Um, next step. So I need to finish this project. We're going to have a we're going to have two conversatorios. Um, they're coming up next week, or yeah, well, no, they're coming up the sixth and the twelfth of December. Um, and so I'm just getting all the materials compiled for that. It's definitely a pilot, um, and it was really interesting because we're trying to open up the debate to see how these organizations can continue to work. So a lot of self-advocacy organizations are normally linked to a university. Um, and in Chile, there aren't many universities that are um, looking to do studies with people with disabilities, and the ones that do um, aren't working with people with disabilities. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we can link the two and make more of an institute that works specifically with people with disabilities. Um, so analysis, so I haven't had, uh, because I had to work with five groups for four hours each week, I have not had time to analyze the information. Um, so the next step is analysis of my field work and the exam videos um, because we're trying to compile a secondary report on what Chile, what was said during the exam um, because we want to have a type of efficient monitoring, or I do, um, and publications. Um, we want to do one about awareness of rights. I want to do one about how people with disabilities feel about their rights, which is much more of a qual qualitative analysis, um, about the methodology that I use because it's new in Chile and the results of the intervention, so like what's been going on through the working groups. And then, um, yeah, I applied for a master's in public policy um, to try to continue to help Chile um, work from a public policy standpoint and implement, have people with disabilities participate in the formation of a public policy on mental capacity that is respects the rights of people with disabilities. And I just want to say thank you. Sorry you guys had to sit through so much information. I hope it wasn't like too dry. I want to say thank you to Fulbright for allowing me to use this, this awesome conference room and also for your support um, to the university because they've been very generous with me in supporting my project in multiple ways. Um, to the observatory I'm currently working with on the rights of persons with disabilities. It's been a fun ride helping them to um, further develop. They're actually one of my sponsors and they were going to take over the campaign but they had some internal conflicts when I left. Um, and thank you to Daniel for allowing me to use your apartment like four times a week because I had to live in Valpo sometimes. So thank you guys. <laughs>